So why don't I begin? Uh, so, uh, right, this is joint work. Oh, wait, is it working? Yeah, joint work with uh, a student, uh, Michal Gorzazewski, um, and he visited me in New York uh, a while back, and that's where we started this project. It's a fun little project, and I hope you enjoy it. So it, it starts with a very natural question, what I find to be a very natural question. Is there a computable non-standard model of arithmetic? And uh, so what I mean by that is, can we find uh, a kind of computable copy of a non-standard model of arithmetic? Can we find computable operations plus and times so that if I use those plus and times, I've got a non-standard model of say piano arithmetic. Now this question is to my way of thinking, uh, highly relevant. It's philosophically relevant for the foundations of calculus in the following sense. Of course, Newton and Leibniz developed calculus on the uh, basis of infinitesimals. And those were eliminated in the 19th century, of course, with the epsilon delta, familiar epsilon delta account. But then Robinson in the 1950s proved uh, that it's possible to have a completely rigorous foundation for calculus using non-standard analysis, where we have a, a, a non-standard version of the reals that have infinitesimal elements and infinite elements. And of course, a part of that non-standard analysis would be that you also have non-standard integers and non-standard natural numbers, non-standard rational numbers, and so on, but in particular, non-standard natural numbers. Um, and, uh, and so the fact that this question um, uh, has a negative answer is pouring cold water to my way of thinking on the idea of, uh, uh, of, of this nonsense analysis done computably. We cannot have a calculator or a computer program that calculates in a non-standard model of arithmetic. Uh, it's simply impossible because there is no such non-computable non-standard model. Okay, so let me review Tenenbaum's uh, theorem. So there's no computable non-standard model of PA, it's impossible. And one of the ways to prove that uh, is the following. <clears throat> Suppose that we had a computable non-standard model of piano arithmetic. Uh, so now let A and B be computably inseparable CE sets. So these are computably enumerable sets, disjoint. We can enumerate their elements uh, but there's no computable separation. We cannot find any computable set uh, that, that separates them. So for example, there's many instances of this. If you look at the set of Turing machine programs that output zero, that halt and output zero versus the Turing machine programs that halt and output one. Those are both CE sets and they're disjoint, but there's no computable separation because if you had a program that could separate them, then on that program itself, of course, if you look at the characteristic function, uh, if it was in the set, then the output would be one, and so it would have to be in B and not allowed. And if it wasn't in the set, then the output would be zero, and it would be A, and that would be a contradiction as well. Okay, but there's many other examples. For example, the set of theorems and, and negations of theorems uh, is a computer, CE computably uh, inseparable set. So we fix these sets. And then we interpret them inside M. Of course, they're computably enumerable. So there's a program for each of them that enumerates them and that I can run that program inside this non-standard model. Now in the non-standard model, they might no longer be disjoint because maybe the non-standard model uh, puts some numbers into both of them. But at the standard finite stages of the enumeration procedure, the non-standard model will agree with our enumeration procedure, and so they'll be disjoint uh, at standard stages. And so in particular, by overspill, there must be some non-standard time t where the numbers that m thinks have been enumerated into a and the numbers that m thinks have been enumerated into b are still disjoint, so at that non-standard time. And this is, what, this is a set that m thinks is finite, and so in particular, it it can code that set with a number. It can say multiply all the primes together that are indexed by uh, an index in this set. And that would be a number coding this finite set inside M. Uh, and then because, these can, because these, the arithmetic is computable here, we can do decoding and we can recognize for any standard N whether it's in that set or not. Uh, 
And so what it shows is that uh, we can compute a set. This would include all of the elements of A and none of the elements of the actual B. And so this would be a computable separation contradiction. So therefore, there can't be any such computable non-standard model. Now, of course, one can also ask a similar question. Could there be a computable model of set theory, say, of ZFC, or even a weaker theory? Um, and, uh, and, and so we would want a computable relation on the natural numbers so that this structure was a model of set theory. Uh, and again, the answer is no. And now we don't need any non-standardness requirement. We can just prove it outright. There's no computable model of set theory at all, whether it's standard or non-standard. And the proof is very similar. Um, suppose that we had a computable model of ZF, say. Um, then, uh, well, again, fix the computable, computably inseparable CE sets. And we can interpret those sets inside M because it's a model of set theory. It has the programs that we use to enumerate them. And so we can see what that model thinks uh, 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 happens with those programs when you run the enumeration. And we could just let C be the set of numbers that the model thinks get in, enumerated into A before they get enumerated into B. I mean, in case they overlap, otherwise we just take M's version of A. Um, and that's a perfectly good set inside the model. And so there's a number that represents the set inside the model. And now we can ask membership questions about that set. So there's a very subtle issue here. And that is given a number N like 17 or 65 or something, we wanna find the number in M that represents that number, right? Cause we have a whole model of set theory built on the natural numbers. It can't be that the number seven, that every number is represented by itself, right? Because we have to also represent the set of reals and the power set of the reals and the set of continuous functions and everything else that exists in set theory. So there's some number here, there's some natural number that's representing the number seven. And I wanna be able to compute from a given number n, which number it is inside this model represents it. And that turns out to be a computable function, but it's not as easy as you might think because uh, all you have is the set membership requirement. And so it's not like you can just go and wait and see some pattern uh, in the epsilon relation that's gonna enable you uh, to say, yes, this is the number seven, because of course, every pattern that's realized is realized infinitely often. This is the nature of set theory. If I can recognize some pattern of membership and non-membership, some finite pattern, then uh, that same pattern is gonna happen all over the place. And so uh, it can't be that I recognize that way. I'm gonna need parameters in the algorithm to, to, to compute this function, but it is possible. And I'm gonna come back to that more later in the details of the other argument. So this map is computable. And now uh, we can just ask membership uh, about whether the number N is in C or not. And that will be a computable separation of A and B. So again, that's a contradiction. And so there can't be any computable model of set of set theory. So by the way, if anyone has any questions during the talk, I'm totally happy to take questions in the middle. If it's just some small question, if it's an extended argument or something, then we can hold off until the end. Okay, so what I'm interested in, in doing is generalizing the Tenenbaum phenomenon beyond, um, hang on one second, uh, uh, beyond those two cases, I wanna look at various generalizations. And in particular, I wanna generalize to computable quotient presentations. So what is that? A computable quotient presentation of a structure is a computable structure. So I've got the natural numbers with some computable functions and relations on it, together with an equivalence relation E, so that the given structure is isomorphic to the quotient. Okay, so it's a it's a quotient construction, but I don't insist that E is computable. Okay, so I've got a it's a quotient of a computable model. That's what a computable quotient presentation is. Um, and so, of course, one can consider computable quotient presentations of graphs or groups or orders or whatever you like, models of set theory, models of arithmetic. Um, now, in a, when you I have, have a, sure. I have a question, a question. so this is Arnand. Uh, can, you, can, you, can you ask for that, a, that E is arithmetic or something like that? Or define Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, we're gonna look at that refinement. So CE or co-CE or whatever, arithmetic, projective, whatever you like. And those are gonna be interesting questions. And in fact, that issue is gonna come up later. Thank you. 
Okay, so when you have when you have relations in your language, for example, in the case of set theory, then it's also natural to look at say computably enumerable quotient presentations where the relation is only CE instead of being computable. Here, if they're functions and so on, then asking for a CE graph or computable is the same thing. But when it's a relation, then it's a natural uh, refinement of the situation to ask for the basic structure to be, say, merely CE instead of computable. Okay, so let me mention Bakaider Kusenov's uh, program. So in a 2016 conference in Kyoto that I was at, uh, he outlined a sweeping vision for computable quotient presentations um, and proposing them as a very fruitful alternative approach to computable model theory with, certain, uh, with a certain philosophical uh, attitude that I'm going to explain. Um, and that is this attitude towards the identity relation. So quotient presentations offer a fundamentally different attitude towards equality. I mean, of course, because they're quotients. But, uh, and what is this? In the case of computable presentations, so when you don't do any quotienting and you just do ordinary computable model theory, then you get automatic computability of identity. If you have two numbers, then if they're the same number, then they're representing the same object in the model. And if they're different numbers, then they're definitely representing different objects in the model. And so it's, it's kind of built into the framework of ordinary computable model theory that you know when things are equal and when they're not equal because the, if numbers are not equal, then they're not equal in the model. But in a computable quotient presentation, we relax that property a little bit. So we can't, given two different numbers, we don't really know whether or not they, they're representing the same object in the quotient or whether they're representing different objects in the quotient, because that has to do with the complexity of deciding the E relation, the equivalence relation is the equality relation in the quotient. And so it could be that we can't tell whether we have different objects or not. Okay. So the so part of the attraction of the quotient presentation is to loosen this computational grip of computable model theory on the identity relation. Okay, so at that conference in Kyoto, uh, Bach had made two conjectures, the following. Uh, um, no, he, so he said, no non-center model of arithmetic should admit a computable quotient presentation by a CE equivalence relation. Um, and, uh, but if you allow a co-CE equivalence relation, then he thought it should be possible. Okay, so those are the two conjectures. They're both generalizations of Tenenbaum. The first one is directly generalizing Tenenbaum, saying you can't do it with a CE relation. And this is sort of an anti-Tenenbaum theorem saying with co-CE, you should be able to do it. Okay, so in this talk, I'm gonna prove the first conjecture and I'm gonna refute some variations of the second conjecture, uh, including the natural analogs in set theory. Um, but some of the variations are still open. Okay. So let me, before doing that proof, let me just mention that uh, there's a sense in which every theory has quotient presentation. So every consistency theory in a functional language, so if there's no relation symbols, then you always get a computable quotient presentation by an equivalence relation of comparatively low Turing degree. So Anand, you never need to go very high in the arithmetic hierarchy, just even low is, uh, is good enough. Um, and this is, uh, th this is uh, just following from the, computer, from the computably effective completeness theorem. So if you think about the Hankin construction, so you start with this consistency theory, then you add in the Hankin assertions, add in Hankin witnesses, and you consider the, the tree of attempts to complete the theory. So we build the tree and, and we keep building the tree, but at any point when we're adding branches to the, when we're adding nodes to this tree, so we add a sentence or a negation and so on, uh, as long as what we're looking at seems like it's consistent. But if we build high enough that we find the contradiction, then, we, then that branch stop, that node stops growing. You know? And so, uh, so this is the tree of attempts to find a complete consistent Hankin theory extending the given theory. So that, that can be done computably. Um, and, uh, uh, and the key point 
is that the term algebra, if we just look at what terms, what syntactic compositions of terms from the Hankin constants can you form? Well, you can take f of c and g of c comma d and so on. You can build up the term algebra and that's computable. That's the main idea of this proof. The term algebra is a computable algebra. If you don't have to form the identity between the terms, you just build the terms, then, well, if, I'm, if I have a function symbol and I have a bunch of terms and then I can apply that function symbol to those terms by just building another term, and that's a computable thing to do uh, at the level of syntax. And so the term algebra is complete and the equivalence relation is what comes from the branch to the tree. Of course, I pick a branch to the tree, that's gonna tell me when I should identify two terms as being equal or not. And then of course, the, the Hankin proof shows that, that the resulting quotient is a model of the theory. Um, and so what we've got here is a computable structure, the term algebra, modding out by the equivalence relation, which might not be computable, uh, that comes from the branch of the tree, but the equivalence relation will be low because every computable tree has a low branch by the low basis. Theorem. Okay, so the slogan is that the Hankin model uh, is, is a quotient of the term algebra and therefore every CE functional theory uh, has a computable quotient presentation. Okay, now of course this is highly relevant in the context of universal algebra when you're doing first order logic without any relation symbols, of course, uh, then you always have this term algebra hanging around and every algebraic structure is a quotient of the associated term algebra with enough generators. So every countable group is a quotient of the free group, uncountably many generators and so on. In, in general, every countable algebra is a quotient of the term algebra. Um, and so in a sense, this, this quote, computable quotient idea is, is much more relevant for uh, universal algebra than for model theory when you have relations. Um, it works much, much better in that case. Okay, so, uh, right. So in purely functional languages, it's a much better and more satisfying theory. Um, okay, oh, let's see, this is a little redundant here. Okay, so the term algebra is always computable because you can just apply the function syntactically to the terms and make another term. And the, what's difficult is to decide when two terms are representing the same thing. And that's where the identity or equivalence relation comes in when you're forming the quotient. So Bakaider presents this as what he calls the domain problem, namely every equivalence relation E determines a kind of domain, the quotient, the equivalence classes. And the question is which for which equivalence relations can a structure have a computable presentation on that domain? Or which classes of equivalence relations, so CE or co-CE, or a certain level of arithmetic hierarchy, or what, what have you? Okay, so there's certain problems arise when you have relation symbols, and that will come up uh, in a bit. So let's turn now to um, quotient presentations of models of arithmetic. Um, and I want to prove that the first conjecture is true. So this is our theorem. So no non-centered model arithmetic has a computable quotient presentation by a CE equivalence relation. So this is Tenenbaum's theorem for quotient presentations by CE equivalence relations. So here's the proof. We're going to prove it in the restricted language, even the functional language. Of course, in arithmetic, you can define the order from the arithmetic. Uh, so expressively, you don't need the, the order, although the traditional language of arithmetic has plus times zero, one and less than that. But uh, we can prove this theorem even just with plus and times. Um, okay, so the claim is that there's no computable structure whose quotient by a CE congruence relation uh, gives you a non-center model of arithmetic. So let's do the proof. So suppose we had one. Suppose we had a computable quotient presentation that was forming a non-center model of PA. Okay, so of course there's some, there's some number, there's some natural number that's representing the number zero and some other numbers representing the number one. And because this plus operation is a computable operation, we can compute the number that's gonna, that's gonna represent uh, N. For any N, we can compute a representative of n. Of course, it might have many representatives, and this is just going to be one of them. 
Um, but we can compute one of them is the point using the fact that plus is computable. Um, and now again, just like in the Tannenbaum proof, fix computably inseparable CE sets. And we can interpret the programs that do the enumeration. We can interpret those programs inside this model. This is a non-center model of arithmetic. So it is perfectly capable of talking about Turing machine computations. Um, and so, uh, so if I, again, go to some non-standard stage of the enumeration procedure at which the programs are still enumerating disjoint sets, then there will be some, some set inside the model that the model thinks is finite. It's actually infinite, but it's a pseudo-finite set. It's a non-standard finite set. Um, and it contains the actual set A, and it's disjoint from the actual set B. Um, OK, and now, of course, we can we can code this set C with, say, the prime product coding. So inside the model, it's a definable set. I'm going to multiply all the primes together that are indexed by elements of that set inside the model. So n is in C, just in case the nth prime divides C, for example. And now uh, let B similarly code the complement of C. So I'm going to multiply all the other primes together up to that same height. So I've got these two finite sets and their complements up to that non-standard stage. And now for any given n, this is a standard n. This is what we're going to do now outside the model. For any given n, we're going to search for an x in, in the natural numbers so that if I multiply x by pn bar, which I can compute, uh, I want to ask, is it e equivalent to c? Or can I find an x so that if I multiply x by pn bar, it's equivalent to b? So, so in other words, I'm asking, does, does pn divide c or does it divide b? It's going to divide exactly one of them because they're complements. And the model thinks that exactly one of those things is going to have a solution. So we're going to find a solution one way or the other here. And, uh, and E with CE. And so we'll know whether or not PN is dividing C or is it dividing B. And so in that way, we can decide membership in C for the standard number. N. Uh, so that's a computable separation because all the elements of A, uh, C is covering A and this from B. So all the elements of A are going to be uh, put into the set, and none of the elements of B are going to be put into the set. And so we found a computable separation. Uh, Joel, can I ask a question? Sure, please. Uh, in this setup at the top of the page, <clears throat> so you have this, this plus with a circle, and times with a circle are re computable recursive functions, right? Yes. And, and are, you, are you requiring that they are invariant under E? It should be a congruence so okay, that. So so they don't have to be well defined with respect to E. That's much, much too strong. They only have to be a congruence. A congruence. So E so E respects those operations. That's yeah, otherwise the quotient doesn't make sense, right? Well, you could you could say there is, yeah, you're right. That, that, so that's what I mean. Okay, fine. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah. Okay, thank you. I don't, yeah, when I don't insist that it's well defined with respect to E. And yeah. because like that's almost never true when you define with. A lot of people misuse the word well-defined when they really should be saying congruence. I think in many applications of mathematics, when you define a function depending on an equivalence relation, but you, like for example, modular arithmetic, is addition well-defined mod five? No, because the, the answer that you get when you add mod five is not the same, it's just equivalent mod five. So that's, what it, that's the difference between being well-defined and being a congruence. And so here we only have the weaker notion. We only need the weaker notion. But that's what you should mean in order to form that quotient. Thank you. OK, so uh, right. OK, so that's a proof of the quotient version of the Tenenbaum theorem in the case when equivalence is CE. So that's proving Buckheiter's first conjecture. OK, so in fact, we can weaken we can weaken what the hypotheses uh, in a similar way. So Tannenbaum proved actually a stronger thing than what I had said earlier. Namely, he proved that you can't even have a non-standard model of arithmetic such that the plus is computable, let alone time. So the way I stated it, we assumed both of them were computable. But in fact, Tannenbaum proved neither one of them can be computable. 
and we can get that stronger result here. And it's very simple because when we're what we needed in the proof was to multiply x by p n bar, but this was a standard finite number, and so we could have just added instead. We didn't need multiplication uh, to do the decoding. We only needed addition. Um, and so what we can deduce is that there's no quotient presentation whose plus is computable and whose equivalence relation is CE that gives you a non-standard model. And you can also do a similar thing with the multiplication only if you just push all the coding into the exponents instead of with the primes themselves. And then uh, when you're multiplying, it, of course, exponentiation turns multiplication into addition. And, uh, and so uh, we can do the same argument assuming only that times is computable and we don't never need to talk about plus. Okay, um, right. So let me give a, now an alternative proof of that theorem uh, using what's called the standard system of a, of a non-centered model. So when you have a non-centered model of arithmetic, then you can look at say all the definable sets with parameters, definable with parameters. Um, and those definable sets have a certain trace on the standard numbers. And so we take all those sets of standard numbers. That's the standard system. It's the trace of all the definable sets on the standard part. Uh, and that's equivalent, of course, because these are models of arithmetic. If I have a definable set, maybe it's infinite inside the model, but I can chop it off. And now inside the model, I've got a finite set and that finite set can be coded inside the model with you know, prime power coding or whatever coding you want. Um, and so you could also equivalently define the standard system as the collection of sets that arise uh, as a coded set in the model uh, in that way. Okay, so for example, we could do the coding. This is the coding that we used before. Namely for any number C in the model, we can look at the set of N so that the nth prime divides C uh, that's a set of natural numbers, and that's what it means to be coded in the model. Um, now, of course, what I'm saying is that uh, if I just throw all these sets together, that's the standard system. So any set that you can define at all, of course, is going to be coded this way because you can chop it off uh, inside the model at some non-standard point, uh, and then on the, the trace will be the same. Okay, that's the standard system. And Dana Scott had observed a couple of things about these standard systems, namely, Every standard system, of course, has all the computable sets in it, um, and it's closed under relative computability. So if I have a set in the standard system, then anything I can compute from that should also be in. So it's downward closed in the Turing degree. Um, and furthermore, whenever I have an infinite binary tree that's coded in the standard system, then it will also have an infinite branch through that tree. Um, because if the model thinks that I have a, 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 a number coding, a set that's, a non, that's an infinite tree, then by overspill, it will be an infinite tree to some non-standard height. And so the model will have a branch that reaches into the non-standard part, and that will be an infinite branch through the actual tree. So basically, that's showing that the standard system is, uh, is fulfilling uh, the weak Koenig's lemma. <clears throat> and, and he proved, let's see, um, uh, so Scott proved that, in fact, those properties characterize the standard systems in the countable case. If I have a countable family of sets of natural numbers and they contain every computable set and they're closed under relative computability and they have the property that whenever there's a tree coded by one of those sets, then there's a branch through that tree coded by another one of those sets, then it is the standard system of a model of PA. Uh, and, and also the standard system of a model of set theory and so on. So in the countable case, it's an if and only if characterization. And that was later extended um, to the case of omega one sized families. So every omega one sized Scott set, these are called Scott sets with these properties, uh, is the standard system of a model of PA. So under the continuum hypothesis, that's a complete characterization, but we don't know, unfortunately, it's, it's still open. Uh, if the continuum hypothesis fails, then we don't know whether every Scott set is the standard system of a model of PA or not. Okay, what I wanna take from this though is that every standard system must have some non-CE sets. The branches through the computable trees might not be computable. Uh, okay, but the argument we gave before showed that if the equivalence relation is CE, 
then uh, every cell in the standard system is CE because we described how to do the decoding. And, and so we can enumerate the members of any coded set. Uh, and that's a contradiction to the fact that the standard system must have non-computable elements. Okay, so let's now go to the full language of arithmetic. I wanna make sure, well, let's see, what am I doing on time? Okay, um, so now let's add the, the rest of the, the less than relation. Now, of course, it's much too strong if we insist that less than is computable because then we could compute equality. If less than is computable, then, I mean, to be equal just means that neither one is less than the other. And so if I could compute less than, then I could compute equality. And so I'm not really doing a quotient. Um, uh, so we really want to look at weaker notions such as CE quotient, where the less than relation is just a CE relation instead of fully computable. Uh, and also, I want to look at the reflexive order. Of course, these are by expressive. We don't need the order at all, uh, but uh, it's natural. Both of them I find natural. Okay, there's some easy lemma here. If you have an equivalence relation and you have a computable relation whose quotient is a strict linear order, you know, like less than, then, then E is computable. That's just what we said before, because uh, to be equal means that neither one is strictly less than the other. So, uh, so if this is computable, then the equality is gonna be computable. If the relation is only CE though, and the quotient is a strict linear order, then automatically E is going to be cos-CE. Um, because to be unequal means one of them is less than the other, which is something that you'll be able to observe. Okay. And then in the reflexive case, if you have a reflexive order whose quote, so if you have a computable relation whose quotient is a linear order, meaning reflexive, transitive, and anisometric, then, then E again has to be computable. Uh, and, and that's just because the things are, are equal if and only if they're less or equal each other. And that's what you can compute. Um, and similarly, uh, if the reflexive order is only CE, then E will have to be CE. Okay, so this kind of easy reasoning uh, uh, basically answers the question in the in the case with the orders. So you can't have a non-standard model of PA in the language with the order that has a, a computably enumerable, not only just a computable quotient presentation, but a CE quotient presentation by a CE relation. And the reason is that uh, if this quotient was a non-center model uh, and E was CE. Well, by the lemma, it would have to also be cos-CE. And so it would have to be computable. And so we could pick representatives. If E is computable, then we can pick representatives and, uh, and we'll have basically a computable presentation which would violate Tenenbaum. So of course there's an alternative is just ignore the relation. And then we're talking about a CE quotient presentation of a functional model, which we already handled with the first theorem. Okay, so let's go to the second conjecture. So, so Kosenov had conjectured that there's some non-center model with a, with a computable quotient presentation using cos-CE equivalence relation. So let's refute that in the language, in this language even for the CE quotient presentation, okay? So suppose we had a CE quotient presentation. In fact, you can't do it by an equivalence relation of any complexity whatsoever. And the reason is, well, suppose that you had a quotient like this, where this was a CE structure. So the operations are computable and the relation is CE. Uh, well, by the lemma, E has to be CE because th that, that sort of trivial reasoning shows there's this automatic computability of equality when you have an order. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so it's just the first theorem again uh, because we're, the equivalence relation must be CE in this case. Okay, so you can't do it in the reflexive order version by any equivalence relation because it would have to be CE. Okay, so it's, maybe cheating to put the order into the language. I think that's how I view it. It's, it's cheating to look at quotient presentations when you have an order because it's too tightly connected with equality and it just reduces to the computable case too easily. 
So let's go back to the functional language. And, uh, and I wanna prove a version of the second conjecture. I'm gonna refute the second conjecture in the case of true arithmetic. So you cannot, uh, um, yes, so there's no non-center model of true arithmetic. We're gonna sharpen this. We don't need all of true arithmetic, but just very little actually. But let's just first do it for true arithmetic. You can't have a computable quotient presentation using a co-CE equivalence relation. So suppose you had such a model um, by a co-CE equivalence relation. So let one bar be the number that's, that, that's representing the number one inside the model. So we can, by adding one plus one plus one, we can represent any number n that way we can compute. Uh, and let H code the halting problem up to some non-standard height. It's a model of true arithmetic. So it agrees with us about which programs halt. So therefore the actual halting problem is coded in the model up to some non-standard height. Um, and now let A and B not just be computably inseparable, but let them be computably inseparable with respect to an oracle for zero jump. Okay, so, so we, we ask for zero jump computably inseparable sets. So they're both enumerable with zero jump as an oracle and they're not zero jump separable. Um, and then we can use this fake zero jump. It's the non-standard version of zero jump up to some non-standard height. The model thinks it's finite, but it agrees with the actual zero jump on the standard numbers. And so I can use that as an oracle for computation and I can let C be the numbers that are put into A using that fake or before they're put into B. So this is gonna be a separating set. And, uh, and if you think about it, it has complexity delta two because uh, with zero jump as an oracle, we can compute E. And what we're asking for is uh, a solution of this divisibility equation by a cos to E relation. So that's a sigma two statement and the negation is also a sigma two statement. So it's delta two and therefore computable from the actual zero jump. Um, and that's a contradiction because it's a separating set, but these were, these were supposed to be zero jump computably inseparable. Okay, let me give a different proof now. Um, suppose I had a, a, a computable model by a co-CE uh, equivalence relation of true arithmetic. Therefore, zero jump is in the standard system because the model agrees with us about which programs halt. So it, it computes zero jump correctly. Um, but, but now we can argue just as we did, every set coded in the model is gonna be computed from zero jump. Okay, because of the argument that we just gave. Um, but, uh, but, but that contradicts Scott's theorem because zero jump is in the standard system. So there must be sets, other sets in the standard system that aren't computable from zero jump. But every set we argued is computable from zero jump. So that's a contradiction. Okay, so in fact, we don't need true arithmetic at all. All we need is much, much less. Sigma one sound is enough. So the model should simply have the same sigma one truths that we do uh, in the standard model. Uh, so you can't have a sigma one sound non-standard model of PA that has a computable quotient presentation by a co-CE equivalent relation. So this is refuting the second conjecture in the case of sigma one sound models. Uh, Okay, well, we already showed it's enough if zero jump is in the standard system. And if it's sigma one sound, then it's gonna be correct about which programs halt. And so the zero jump is gonna be in the standard system. But in fact, we can prove the theorem even just knowing that zero jump is in the standard system. And that's weaker than sigma one sound because we can put zero jump into the standard system of any model that we want. I mean, any theory, by a compactness argument, you can always put zero jump into the standard system of a model of that. And for any extension of PA, there's a model of it that has zero jump in the standard system by a compactness argument. Um, so what we really proved is that no non-standard model of arithmetic, oh, we don't need less than here. Let's see. Oh, this is computably enumerable. Um, oh, no, no, I'm sorry a computably enumerable quotient presentation. So the relation less than is, is CE uh, by a relation of any complexity. And the reason is that uh, 
if this is CE and we take the quotient, then E has to be co-CE, but then we already ruled out that case um, when zero jump is in the set. Okay, so uh, the central case of the second question though really remains open. So can you have a non-center model of PA in the, in the usual language with less than, which has a CE quotient presentation by some co-CE equivalence version? We had to make these extra assumptions either that it was sigma one sound or that zero jump was in the standard system, or we had to use less or equal instead of less than. And so we don't technically know the answer to this question. Okay, um, so let's go on uh, to set theory. What time is it? Oh my gosh, okay. Uh, let's see. So is it okay if I go a little bit over the 45 minutes or uh, maybe I'll... Yes, the home time is one hour. Uh, we can have okay. less questions. Okay. Okay, so the main theorem is that no model of ZFC has a computable quotient presentation by an equivalence relation of any complexity. So in set theory, we get the full we get the full uh, result. You just can't have computable quotient presentations of models uh, of set theory by by an equivalence relation of any complexity. Um, so in other words, there's no computable relation epsilon. And the constellation E such that the quotient is a model of set C. Okay, so let's describe the proof. Suppose that you had it. We don't need ZFC. Very, very weak theory is enough. Now there's this annoying thing that proof involves this really detailed consideration of what's going on uh, with coding and interpretation in set theory. Because if all you have is the epsilon relation, you can't compute you know, what's the number seven or what's the number 65? Uh, that, that, that's basically impossible to compute. We can prove, uh, so we're gonna need these parameters. So I'm gonna fix a number in the model that's representing the set of natural numbers. It's a model of set theory, so it has a set of natural numbers and it has a set that represents the successor function on the natural numbers. And it has a, a set that represents the set of singletons of natural numbers and another set that represents the set of doubletons, I mean, with actually two elements of natural numbers. And now using all these parameters, I can compute the function that takes a number n to the set that's coding it inside the model. And it's just irritating. It's more complex than you expect. But th the way it works is, okay, you're given a number n. Now we, we can give ourselves the number zero. And now how do we find the number one? Well, we have this, we have the successor function, but we can't just apply it because we don't have it as a function. We only have it as this set of elements, but the elements of it are just other sets that happen to be pairs and the pairs are this Kurtowski pairing thing. And so the elements of S are themselves sets that have two elements, which are themselves, one of which is a singleton and the other of which is a doubleton. And then I can recognize which, in, which are which using these sets, because if it's an element of, of sing, then it's a singleton. And if it's an element of dub, then it's a doubleton. And then I can look for the, the sets that are elements of those things and so on. And in this way, unwrapping all that coding, I can find the number one. And then I can find the number two and so on, I can iterate it. So that's how we can compute the number that represents n for any given n. And now uh, it follows that every set in the standard system is computable because every set is represented by some number and its elements are represented by the things that are epsilon related to it. And if I can compute this map, then I can compute what are the sets of natural numbers that are represented in the model, that are coded in the model. Um, and so every set in the standard system will be computable and that contradicts Scott's theory. Okay, here's an alternative argument. Suppose I have a computable relation and the quotient is a model of set theory. Well, by extensionality, Two sets are different just in case there's some set that's in one of them and not the other. So I can look for that to happen. So that, that's saying that two sets are inequivalent just in case there's an existential witness that there's some object that's an element of one and not in the other. So therefore E has to be co-CE, okay? If you have a quotient and it's a model of set theory of extensionality, then E has to be co-CE. Uh, and so we can just argue now from the co-CE case. So let's do that. You can't have a CE relation even, not even, it doesn't even have to be computable, but CE is enough. 
so that it has a cosy quotient, which is a model of step three. So suppose, suppose that we had such a model. Well, we have a number that represents the set of all singletons of natural numbers. So if I have two numbers, if there's a singleton that they're both elements of, then they have to be equivalent, they're equal. And so that means that equality uh, becomes computable. It's cosy -E because the relation was cosy, -E, but it's also CE -E because I can look for a singleton that they're both an element of. And therefore it's gonna be for the numbers that are natural numbers in the model, it's going to be a computable relation. And therefore I can, uh, I, I can reduce to the classical Tenenbaum case because now I have a computable equivalence relation and I can pick representatives and so on. There's a general observation to make about this cosy -E quotients, namely, uh, when you have a cosy -E equivalence relation, it means you can recognize when things are different. Yeah? If it's cosy, -E, it means you can get the answers for when things are not equal in the quotient. Uh, but therefore, you can tell when you have a number that isn't equivalent to any smaller number, that's going to be the minimal element of its equivalence class. We can recognize that. So therefore, when you have a cosy -E equivalence relation, you can enumerate the set of minimal representatives from each class. So in a purely relational language, it means that you can reduce to a computable presentation because you can pick. So if you have a computable quotient presentation by a cosy -E relation, then you can build a computable presentation by using those minimal representatives. It doesn't work when you have functions in the language for precisely the, the reason that Anam brought up earlier, namely that uh, we don't, if I have functions in the language, then having the set of minimal representatives isn't good enough because when I apply the function to those things, I might not be still a minimal representative and I won't know which ones it's equal to. Um, and so it doesn't work with functions in the language. Um, and then lastly, let me just mention quickly, uh, you can handle the case of finite set theory. Uh, so why don't I just skip this since I'm over time and I'll just say it quickly. Uh, if you work in finite set theory where you don't have any infinite sets, but only finite ones, it's equivalent to PA basically, uh, then we can also prove it. So, uh, okay. And that's the, the COCE case for finite set theory. So thank you very much. That's it. Oh, thank you, Professor uh, Antis. Uh, do you have questions? Um, I had a question. Uh, oh, this is like a silly question. So, the end of the talk, you said that like, uh, so ZFC doesn't have any like um, computable, sorry, any computable model quotient presentation, whatever. I forgot the terms. Right. Earlier, there was a thing that every theory, consistent theory has a computable quotient. Was this because it's, was it like only for functional languages or something? Yes, exactly. So the theorem okay, that right. I mentioned earlier was only for functional languages because we took the quotient of the term algebra, mm -hmm. but we don't have a term algebra in set theory. There's no right, functions okay. at all. In fact, the previous theorem needed there to be only functions and no relations at all. So, um, so if you, if you had some sort of functional language approach to set theory, then you could talk about the term algebra and, and hope to get a version uh, in that language. Okay, thanks. I, I have a question. Uh, sure. Is it, I mean, one could also consider Maybe, maybe it's equivalent, consider natural numbers an equivalence relation. On N mod E, you have the structure of a non-standard model of arithmetic and you make some conditions on the equivalence relation and on the pre-images in N to the three of the graphs of plus and times. Well, so you want to replace the functions with their graphs and go relational. The, you, just, you, take the, you take the graph, take the function on the quotient Take its graph and just take the pre-image of that graph in in in, in n cubed, and you require something about that being having some complexity, and you make some requirements that both e and those two graphs have some level of complexity. Okay, right. 
Now, is that kind of set up equivalent to what you're doing, or is it? Uh, let's see. So, uh, um, well, it depends. Okay, if you have less than or less or equal in the language, also, then you get this kind of automatic decidability for equality that lemma those four cases so so maybe it, it would be more sensible what you're talking about um to to look at the functional language only so with just plus and times and uh so you're going to turn them into relations so yes you know, yeah, I, relations. Would that. So, I mean and, and having and, and having say a recursive or computable relation on into the cubed it doesn't mean that you can that this is represented by an actual function you know so it seems to be more general and also right. natural from the point of view of, you know, natural from the point of view of interpretability of structures. It's a kind of right, natural. So I think it does become. So you, want the, you want the relation that you're talking about on the pre quotient structure to be sort of full in the sense that it, it's, it's working with all the representatives. No, it's, you simply take, no. you have a quotient map, n to n mod e. On e yeah. cubed, I have a. Uh, a I have the graph of uh, an n cubed, you mean? Yeah. Or... And then you take now, now you take the pre Now, of course, you have e goes to n mod n mod e. You have n cubed goes to n cubed mod e on the three. You take the pre image. You take the pre image of that graph. Right. So it has the property that I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. So you're yeah. sort of yeah. filling yeah. out all the equivalence classes. Yes. So that... Exactly. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Right. You, uh... Yeah. Um, okay, so, so will that's my question. If e, I mean, if it's CE, e, if that's, for example, if the if those relations are CE, then you can compute. So it reduces to the to the to the computable case. So maybe it becomes interesting if those if those relations are co CE or higher or something. Yeah, or, or and, maybe um, I mean, Will was suggesting in the chat that you, you can actually turn these primitive of graphs, you can actually pick representatives in some coherent manner. Is that what Will, Will was saying? Maybe that's... Yeah, I think I'm we're just... all saying the same thing. That, I was saying that what Joel just said, that yeah, you can pick their representatives. If they're all yeah. CE, then I think you can pick their representatives. Okay. Yeah, so I don't think that case is going to be different. But there's another sense in which the, the whole idea of looking at these computable quotients, it just doesn't play with relations as nicely as it does with functions. And so replacing the functions with language with relations is in, in from that perspective, the, the backwards thing to do, you should be going the other way and, and replacing relations with functions so that you can use the term algebra, which is computable and so on. And, and yeah. uh, but, so this is, this is Bakaida's perspective is that really it's about universal algebra. Um, yeah. rather than about relational structures uh, and models of set theory. So, but I, I haven't thought about the specifics of your case where you ask for the relation to be, to have, you know, maybe it's sigma two or arithmetic or projective or something. And I think that's an interesting question. I'm going to think about it. Okay, thank you. Thanks, thanks for the talk, Joel. Thank you. Oh, yeah, we have a, a, a Dave Michael, Dave Marker. Yeah, I, I wonder if there's um, any kind of general thing you could do in the case where you add some re relation symbols, but only unary relation symbols. That seems to be you know, much tamer than right. adding binary relations. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, of course, well, in principle, you can add anything, right? I mean, but uh, I guess it was specifically the orders that carried this consequence for E. Right, when you have an order relation that's that for which E is a congruence with respect to it, that's what led to the automatic continuity. So even other kinds of binary relations that aren't order relations maybe would be fine, but unary uh, seems like it should be fine also. So I don't really have anything to say about that except uh, please go ahead <laughs> and look at it. I don't, I don't know uh, what, um, what one could do with that situation. Okay. Uh, Anna, do you have more to say? Right. I saw your raise your hand. It looks like Anand has another one, or? Right. We do have more questions. Uh, and may I ask a question? Uh, yeah, look at the, uh, the kind of model of ZFs. Uh, uh, also the finite uh, set theory or 
uh, have a uh, similar do you have similar results concerning something uh, uh, essentially weaker than even uh, finance sector, say some extension of uh, biograph uh, extension of which uh, uh, some extension of just the uh, diagraph oh I see uh, no I guess uh, right. I'm not sure what the optimal thing is known, even in the case of Tenenbaum, about pushing it below PA. I guess, I guess it would go. I mean, we just needed the the computable inseparability, and so it doesn't seem like we need all of PA at all for the usual Tenenbaum thing. And in the case of set theory, the finite set theory case basically reduced to the PA argument. Um, uh, of course, for finite set theory, it was about um, non-standard models of finite set theory. Uh, of course, there is a computable standard model of finite set theory, the, the Ackerman model, the Ackerman interpretation of finite set theory. I mean, the hereditary finite sets have a computable presentation. Um, so we're, we're talking about non-standard models there. And of course, uh, I don't think you need, you know, full separation and so on. Maybe sigma one is enough, or, but probably the models of arithmetic uh, people know exactly the boundary uh, where the Tenenbaum phenomenon starts happening. Um, I had just stated it for full PA, but you don't need all of that. Um, basically, it's at the level of sigma one because we're talking about computable inseparability. And I would expect a similar thing to happen for models of set theory, but I don't know uh, exactly where that boundary is. Thank you. Uh, if there's no more questions, let's thanks to our speakers here. Thank you.